This podcast is made possible by Avalara. Hi, this is Dave Parsons, CFO of Zuto, and you're listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 925. I'm aware that um, there can potentially be IP issues with using certain generative AI to generate code. There can be confidentiality issues with generative AI dragging data from an organization into a data set that then gets exposed. So uh, we're already moving fast to A, put an AI policy in place at the company. What I've done is, as I've heard about this, I've connected directly with the leadership in the product and engineering team to work together on how can we leverage <clears throat> this technology. It's not that we're going to prevent this technology from entering the, the four walls. It's, it, it, it's, it's a thing. It's going to happen. Let's make sure we do it in a smart way and we leverage it. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with Scott Benyon, CFO of Paystand. If Paystand CFO Scott Benyon was to break his three-decade-long finance career into different technology chapters, the software CFO would likely agree that he and many of his finance leader peers have without question recently opened a new chapter. For Benyon, who remembers tracking CD shipping costs during the desktop era, the latest marker or evidence that a new chapter has opened has everything to do with the productivity of Paystand's product engineering and development team. For its part, Paystand's product engineering and development team has so far experienced a 4x increase in productivity thanks to the adoption of AI and generative AI tools. CFO Scott Benyon explains that and much more on today's episode. We'll begin after this. This episode is presented by Avalair. Ah, that's the sound of not worrying about sales tax compliance. Because when you automate it with Avalara, you don't have to worry about collecting sales tax or tracking who and what is tax exempt. With Avalara, you don't even have to worry about new tax laws and regulations. Avalara does it for you. If your business sells internationally, Avalara has you covered with cross-border tax compliance solutions. And when it comes time to file tax returns, Avalara automatically takes care of that too, giving you one less thing to worry about. Avalara has managed billions of sales for small, mid-size, and enterprise businesses and seamlessly works with your current sales, e-commerce, and accounting platforms. Take the worry out of tax compliance with Avalara. Ah. Learn more at avalara.com. That's A-V-A-L-A-R-A dot com. Hello, we're speaking with Scott Benyon, CFO of Paystand. Scott, welcome. Thanks, Jack. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Scott, as always, we're going to ask you to look back. And we're trying to always pick out those experiences that you think really shaped your leadership as you grew into a finance leader. What, what comes to mind for you? So... Uh... As many of us did, I started my my career in public accounting. I, I began at KPMG in San Francisco. I was working in the international tax team under a, a gentleman named Roger Saboni. It was a it was a very um, hi, highly regarded part of of KPMG's organization. I learned a lot about in that time international business because we you know we did we, a lot of international business is that international taxation i got a, a a good feel for that uh i also got exposure to tech clients so um it was sort of my first uh interaction or or awareness of of the tech industry that had been growing for you know several decades 
Um, and then, of course, as all, all of us do, I learned to pay my dues. So uh, being in the tax department, we had to go to the audit department and beg for audit hours. And one thing I remember to this day was a Christmas Day audit of a frozen orange juice warehouse in the East Bay. So um, I, I'd say uh, uh, that that is one memorable thing I, I, that I'll always remember is just, you know, how hard you work in public accounting and how you're really paying your dues early on in your career. Can I ask you, I, I thought it was interesting, you mentioned somebody who we've actually heard mentioned maybe twice before, uh, Roger Saboni. Why? And and, and I, I don't know Roger, but I, I it sounds like he was somebody who was uh, very present uh, in that office and, and perhaps in KPMG. Was he a prominent partner or what was he? Oh, yes. Roger was a force. Roger was the youngest partner at KPMG when he first became partner. And he really was someone that we looked to as, a, as an inspiration. Um, his, his work ethics, his intelligence, and he rose to prominence within the national firm as well and went on to do a number of really good things. So early on, I would say uh, he was one of the, the figures in my early career that who was a, an example of, of something to aspire to. Why international business? We always hear about tech in uh, the Bay Area, of course. Uh, how did your tour of duty get you more exposed to international business? Yeah, I think I've always had an interest in global uh, affairs and international business. When I was young, my father's business took him all over the globe. So I used to have a big interest that in, he would bring me back, you know, his ch his change from his trips. And back then it was not the euro. Every country had its own currency. So just kind of understanding that, all, you know, as a young, at a young age, um, um, sparked kind of an interest in international, all things international. So when I had an opportunity to work in international tax at KPMG, it, 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 was, a, it was very interesting to me. You'll have to forgive me. I'm reading ahead to the uh, to the next assignment on your your uh, LinkedIn bio. You land at uh, Borland uh, during the Philippe Kahn era. One of the great entrepreneurs of the early '90s really grabbed a lot of headlines. How am I doing? Am I re recalling the correct person? Oh, absolutely. I I um, it's an interesting segue too because I actually jumped from my public accounting days into tech because it, 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 it became a growing interest in Borland was an early company that I joined. And it was during uh, Philippe's um, tenure as, as founder and CEO of the company and interest. And so, yes, this was my first um, interaction with a founder and seeing how dynamic and interesting and, and, and different founders are. They just, they're just, they're just um, wired differently. And he's, as you know, he's still do, starting things up and he's still involved, uh, you know, decades after Borland. But um, sort of fun fact, uh, our current offices at Paystand are in Borland's former initial headquarters before they built the large facility on Highway 17. They were scattered throughout Scotts Valley <laughs> and our current offices are in the former headquarters. Yeah, just an interesting chapter there as well, where he uh, grew this company to compete in the desktop space against the likes of Microsoft, which uh, uh, which did them in eventually, as it did most uh, most desktop software companies, it seemed, in that era. Yeah, well, an interesting learnings from that time are two things. One, uh, Borland actually pioneered the, the, the office suite and use the office suite to try to go after Microsoft strategically, it, it ended up turning around because Microsoft then bundled and used that to a more effectively to steamroll you know, a lot of vendors, including Borland. The other learning at the time was um, we had just uh, completed the acquisition of Ashton Tate. And just uh, understanding the challenges of post-transaction integration, even though I was at a staff level, it impacted me as well, because at the time I was doing consolidations. And so it was now consolidating more entities. We had you know, new people who were uh, coming in from the Ashton Tate acquisition. And, and not only understanding how you know, complex it can be doing that sort of a combination, 
um, both financially and and um, and transactionally, but just on the people level. I you know I, I just watching how people would come in a little guarded and then bringing people in. It's actually been one of the learnings from early in my career. That now, when I'm, you know, many times on both sides of the table, I it, I have an appreciation for how complex that can be. And again, we're going through the '90s, the internet. Uh, there's um, uh, the, some of the first initial IPOs and in search, and uh, you're following the opportunities that come. But we've entered a whole new era altogether. Yeah, that's an that it's an interesting point. Um, I guess if I were to sort of look across my career. I've spent the majority of my career in software. I spent a little time in telecoms, but I've seen those iterations of software from packaged software, you know, uh, CDs, shipping CDs, to downloadable software, to you know, uh, uh, where we are today, which is essentially software as a service. So, seeing those iterations as a go-to-market, as well as you know, on the back end, how it's how it's reflected in our financials. It's been an interesting journey. Um, I took a, uh, one thing that I'll say though, uh, notably early in my career was I did take an opportunity to go overseas with one of my companies. It was a tech company. Interestingly enough, it was called Trinsic. It was an early AI company. It was a rules-based AI company that had a lot of insurance companies as clients. So essentially when you need, when, when, when an insurance company was doing underwriting, it would punch in numbers and this would go through a rubric of of, of, um, of questions and, and kick out a yes or a no. And I got an opportunity to go over to Europe and work in their European headquarters, uh, initially in London, um, and also um, work with the international controller over there with the subsidiaries in various European countries going out doing quarterly reviews, et cetera. And what was interesting to me there was um, one thing I take away is I, I learned what it's like to be in a subsidiary and have to deal with HQ and some of the challenges that that uh, can can occur because you're not at the sort of center of power. And and um, I, I re- I, it, it was interesting because when I was first when I was first posted there. You know, I was the American from HQ, but over time I'd be in meetings and, you know, everyone would complain about the Yanks or the Colonials in uh, in HQ. So I knew that, you know, I had faded into the into the part of the team at that point. So that was a very interesting you know, takeaway. It's it's it could be a challenge to be a, in a subsidiary away from HQ. And, and again, it gives me an appreciation for that when I have subsidiaries and I understand some of the things they may be dealing with. It looks like your your offshore chapter is a bit longer as well. So maybe you can fill us in a little bit about what you were up to for the uh, later portion of the 90s and into that dot-com era. And uh, so where are you on the globe uh, in the late 90s in uh, the dot-com era? Uh, how did you weather the storm when it comes? Yeah, great question. It's one of those seminal events in most uh, of our tech lives, uh, if we've been around long enough. I had I had actually spent about five years overseas. After Europe, I went to Southeast Asia with a company called Platinum Technology and helped them set up down in Southeast Asia. I moved on down to Singapore, uh, working for Nortel. Um, Nortel actually sent me up to Thailand to help open a new a new um, project office, they had won a billion dollar contract to put a new wireless system nationwide in Thailand. I kind of call that my first startup experience because even though Nortel was massive, uh, the Thailand office was a small rep office at the time. And I actually was charged with opening a new office, getting everything connected, um, bringing expats in, processing them in. And then uh, I was there when the currency crisis happened. So I got a little preview of turbulence in, in an industry. The, the, the project was shelved. We, we ended up sending everyone home. And I actually repatriated at the time. But I'd kind of been bitten by the anarchy sort of bug. I kind of liked turning chaos into order is what we do in startups. And so when I came back stateside, 
working for Nortel in, in HQ, kind of buried in the analyst group, uh, I got an opportunity to start working in the startup world, which I, I moved into right before the dot-com bust. So uh, I, I think that the takeaway from that is uh, navigating through massive turbulence that uh, and and I've seen it in my career because I've because I like turning chaos into order. I've really stuck with sort of growth stage companies. Uh, companies always are 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 going through ups and downs in startups. This was obviously an industry down that was that was uh, massively impactful. I remember uh, traffic at the time had lightened up, so you know, silver lining was the commutes were not as bad for us that were lucky enough. To still have jobs, but uh, yeah, I remember that. I remember navigating through it. Um, I also remember a lot of the providers at the time. You, you know, you really know who's got your back when times get tough, and a number of the providers really stuck in there. You know, I can I can tell you that one of them was Silicon Valley Bank. They could have come in and 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 sort of mowed through companies that were having tough times. I got to say. Um, to this day, I have massive respect for the way they worked with companies and did not just simply liquidate and, and get pennies on the dollar. We ended up at the company I was at um, finding an acquirer successfully, which was great. And we ended up um, uh, paying off the SVB uh, facility. You know, pay, uh, So we ended up finding a home for our company. But it was a, it was a, yeah, it was definitely an interesting time, and it definitely uh, uh, taught resilience. And I think a lot of us who went through that, we kind of have the the scars from that. It makes us a little more resilient when you know things go up and down. And and I think it's something that uh, uh, now in tech, obviously with valuations having. Uh, uh, changed quite a bit. There are there are you know crunchy times now for the the cohort that's going through things now. Well, through through that period, you are holding sort of senior roles, director of finance roles, controller roles. Is it clear to you that you're headed to the CFO office someday, or did you look at things differently at that place in time? Was there something that finally got you focused? You know, I think that. Um, I'd always wanted to be the leader of this finance team. So um, I came up through tax. I, I, I learned, uh, I, I went through consolidations. While I was going through my early career, I took sort of a, a tour or understanding of each of the elements under the controllership. I spent time being the controller, and that's where really you get sort of battle hardened. I think the turn. The, the 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 challenge, and I'm sure a lot of leaders tell you this, is there's a there's a certain point where you need to fly high and fly low, and sometimes um, that's that's a challenge in needing to learn that. And I think I think um, one a piece of advice that I received from an investor during that period was, you know, as sort of a CFO or VP of finance who wants to be a CFO. You need to learn to tell a story. You need to be able to give narrative. Um, we get really good at getting data and information and accuracy and timeliness, but then it's all about you know weaving it together and 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 telling a story that's important for a CFO. So I think I think I've always wanted to to move into that role, and I think that was one of the uh, important. Uh, pieces of advice and learnings that I got to, to make that next step. There are plenty of uh, people in the finance industry who are solid operators, solid uh, controllers, solid VPs of finance. I even know folks, they're happy doing that, and that's what they want to do. But I do know that you know taking it to the next level, it's fly high, fly low, and being able to tell a story. You know, I... That's a great uh, point, and and one uh, we'd love to zero in on uh, the, the storytelling piece of it, and sort of coming of age for those uh, aspiring finance leaders who are looking to demonstrate that they have this skill set, who may be looking to challenge themselves to step up and demonstrate they have the skill set. I mean, is this something that 
you would put some thought into knowing that there'd be an opportunity or a discussion that you were going to participate in in the coming days that you would really give some thought as to how you told the story and actually practice it. I mean, it, or does it come naturally? I don't think so. I think there's a lot of thought behind it. It's about making it look easy, perhaps. What would you share with us? I th- my, my feeling is if I were in that stage and I was looking to um, develop the next level, I would start by taking the next step when I produce an analysis. Let's just say it's a revenue analysis and I'm breaking out all of the pieces. I would then trend it out and look at the trend and see if I can figure out hey, why are we seeing movement up, down, or, you know, otherwise? And then, you know, when I submit that to the CFO or, you know, whoever is the um, the person that is consuming the information, I would, I would annotate it with that. I would start doing that. And, and then I would also go to uh, the CFO or, or you know, the, the, whoever is uh, the head of the organization and and let them know your intent. Hey, I, I, I've i done this. Can you give me some feedback on it? Is it giving you the right level of information? And and sort of tune that way. Over time, you know, you you want you also want a leader who's who's making some space for you. Um I I try because I've you know I've been doing this for a little while with my team. I actually help try to stretch them. I, I sort of encourage the stretching to see where the stretching goes to. But if you don't have someone who's doing that, you sort of need to ask for it. And then if uh, most leaders are going to be happy to get that feedback because um, it helps it, it helps the CFO craft the narrative if you've already annotated for them. So I'd say that would be the first thing I would start doing to start developing those skills. And then asking for feedback on on your annotation. Tell us a little bit about uh, what I would refer to as maybe your last lap uh, from being a uh, sort of a vice president of finance, that type of level. uh, And you're taking your last lap to the CFO office. What are the, the types of experiences you're looking to have? What's happening during uh that tenure that last lap tenure what what are you doing what are you up to yeah so one in the in the sort of the sweet spot that i've developed is in growth stage companies and so typically a growth stage company they may not necessarily be looking for the cfo so i've i've always looked for the the whoever is going to head the finance function VP of finance many times is the is the function. Moving from VP of finance to CFO, a lot of that is about uh, forming relationships with the investors, with the board members. So that's one other thing as a CFO you really need to develop is the ability to uh, uh, have a relationship with the board. The board likes having a relationship with the CFO directly. I think that um, in in many cases, unless someone's moved to a position where they've been, you know, um, repeat CFOs, and break, it, you want to break into being a CFO, you're going to likely be in as a VP of Finance first. The way to move to the CFO role, part of it is forming that relationship with investors. What investors are feeling um, is. If this person hasn't been a CFO before, we want to see how they are as a VP of finance before we fill that slot. Because if they fill the slot and then they feel like this is not the right fit, they're going to have to replace that person. So they would rather have a VP of finance and let that VP of finance show themselves and then become the CFO. It's it's always, I think in every rung, it's tough to crack to the next sort of landing. So when I say that, I mean going from accounting manager to controller that's kind of cracking in and as you and the higher you go the more challenging it, it can become the 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 vp um level if you crack that that one is usually a major step up because then you're not only sort of the top financial uh officer and you've been able to demonstrate controllership you're able to demonstrate analytical fpna 
you're also probably, uh, especially in growth stage companies, your 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 portfolio may also include a lot of other things that in larger companies they wouldn't. So, for example, I typically have covered um, uh, facilities, IT, legal, HR, um, pretty much everything other than go to market and product and development, and even in product at Intact at a stand, I end up being a subject matter expert. So I am involved even in product as well, which to me is an interesting element of the job is being able to feed back into the product organization uh, as a subject matter expert. So I, re- I think that that, um, so at Intact, I was able to come in as a VP of finance and then able to form those relationships with board members such that everyone was comfortable to move me into my first CFO role. Well, that's a that's a nice career journey segment for us. We'll just jump to our business segment then and ask you uh, about this company, Paystand. What does this company do and, and what are its offerings? Sure. So Paystand offers a next generation B2B payments platform to mid- mid-market enterprise customers, enabling t- them to achieve what we like to call radically better treasury economics. And the way we do that is we, 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 we go to market with an ROI model that has three elements. We, we, we help companies eliminate fees. We help companies automate payment workflows. And then we help mo- um, companies reduce the time to cycle cash through, their, through the business cycles. Uh, so what we find when we go to market uh, against some of our competition, co- there are, the competition usually focuses on one of those elements. We take a more holistic approach. So we're, 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 we, we, will, we will help companies process payments on all of their rails, automate the payments, and achieve ROI on, on the platform that they invest in with Paystand. Could you uh, be interested in learning a little bit about its its capital structure? Can you give us maybe an abbreviated history of Paystan's capital structure? Sure. So uh, originally funded a, a approximately 10 years ago, 2013 time. Uh, uh, we've done uh, through Series C uh, approximately 90 million raised to date. And so we would look at ourselves as sort of um, mid to late stage company. We're looking to, you know, we've been growing at a at a rapid clip, and um, really what we have envisioned is is being a public company in the next two to three years. We I, I call us a next generation uh, payments company because we employ. Uh, next generation technology, such as uh, we, 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 we integrate with ERP systems like Intact and NetSuite in order to achieve workflow automation, et cetera. But we also offer some of our more advanced features using blockchain as an underlying technology. So um, one, of, one of my learnings out of Paystand is, is really how uh, blockchain and distributed finance it's more of an infrastructure um, technology than it is what has caught the headlines, which is a lot of the the crypto elements. Crypto is just a use case of blockchain. We we leverage blockchain to do a a, a lot of very interesting advanced um, features to help our customers not only not only manage their payments but optimize their payments. So, for example, helping customers. Who have a lot of a lot of their customers on high cost credit cards, for example, uh, move their customers off of those rails onto more inexpensive rails like a bank to bank or ACH. Um, and uh, we're we're so we'll we'll embrace a customer with the processing environment and landscape they have, and then help them optimize that to to eliminate the fees. And to automate the workflows, and then to to cycle their cash much more quickly. I, 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 an, another sort of interesting, um, in, an interesting data point also to kind of give it a, give a feel for the size of the company. Recently, we we learned that um, pay stand process is one percent of US B two B ACH. So we we have a significant volume going across our network in the B two B space. One of the 
think about when you step on board, it was 2021. And we're interested in how you might have changed the function in some way or reorganized perhaps the finance function in some way. What what would you tell us about what you, the organization you joined and here it is, you know, 2023 now? Well, I think part of the reason why I joined the organization was to uh, uh, be prepared to be eventually, I'd say eventually a public company, but we always build our companies to be, you know, uh, strong growing uh, uh, viable or enterprises going public is just another funding event to be, to be honest. But, uh, that was, that was the initial reason why I joined the company was, um, uh, the company wanted to level up the organization, um, get ready to take it to the next stage. So the first thing I did when I came in, which I do at any of the, the companies I'm at, Right, you just and and this is probably pretty obvious. You take the lay of the land, you know, see what's what's working, what's not, and what's missing. It, it, again, sort of the old you, you got in order to get to where you want to be, you got to know where you are first to see the path. So really, the first thing was assessing uh, team on the ground, process on the ground, system on the ground. Um, at the time, Paystand, like a lot of companies, had leveraged. Um, s- smaller ERP, they they leverage QuickBooks to the hilt, and I'm always amazed when I come into organizations. Usually, I come into organizations in this context where it's time to level up on the systems process and and potentially people. It's amazing how much uh, horsepower some companies get out of QuickBooks. A lot of it has to do with uh, finance functions. Typically, they figure out a way to get the mission done with not a lot of tools. And then they institutionalize that. Then it almost becomes tough to change. So part of part of what I did was I, you know, I came in, uh, upgraded the ERP, um, added uh, to the team. The uh, teams typically at growth stage companies in the in the GNA area are thin because all of the resources are going into as they should go to market or product and in, uh, engineering. So it's it, it's really about um, taking that first step. Usually, the ERP is one, um, uh, I'd say, tentpole first step coming into organization, taking it to the next level. Uh, um, getting the first audit done is usually a, ve- a, a a first step in taking an organization to the next level. A lot of times, that first audit, um, I look at it as is is also looking at the lay of the land. And identifying gaps, so we have we have gaps that we start um, closing over the next period of time. Uh, uh, so that that those are kind of the first steps. Those are the first steps I usually take coming into an org, and that's you know that's what I've done here as well. When you think about and and I always we refer to it as lines of sight, and I just don't want to ask you what the, some of the metrics are kind of obvious to our audience in particular, but I'm wondering if. As you arrived, you realized that, and and maybe with some of the upgrades and systems, there's more visibility and you're getting certain KPIs that weren't available when you first arrived. But just the understanding of how you evolved the organization from paying very close attention to this set of metrics, but you've introduced them to a few additional ones where you've raised their profile and the understanding across the organization as to why they're they're important could you could you help us is there such a uh, a certain metrics that you would describe in such a way i think that uh generally companies have a pretty good feel for uh say you know revenue metrics uh uh coming in they understand you know revenues up revenues down logos up logos down logos flat I always try to punch into the next level. So, for example, um, if a a company has, let's just say, they have sort of total MRR, total net retention, I wanna I wanna do a couple things. I wanna punch it down to the customer level, and I wanna trend it. So, a lot of times, you also see data points only. Hey, here's how we did during this period. I want to say, okay, well, you know, last 12 months, um, uh, even last 24 months. Let's look at how Let's look at how our revenue streams have grown. Now let's punch it down by customer. Now let's try to segment it 
um, let's let's make sure that our data in our um, source data set is aligned with, say, the um, CRM system with respect to verticals. I've seen so part of it is aligning data because in order to get valid data that everyone agrees with, one, it's got to be common. You can't have a you know data silos. I've seen that before, and then you spend a lot of time arguing over whose data is valid. So you sit, you you have everyone start with the same data and not only the same data set, but also making sure there's consistent um, uh, data hygiene and curation. So so really, I start focusing on data, data sets. Um, I like to see the data tagged with um, vertical information so you can even segment by vertical, see if you got something interesting going on in any verticals, particularly in uh, volume-based businesses because it tell it can tell you a lot about how volumes are behaving uh, based on you know verticals or segmentation, et cetera. So really, I think this is this is um, this is an area where I will sort of punch in. I punch in more on let's make sure our data is consistent and clean, and now let's start punching into it and 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 sort of clicking down a level or two versus what we've we've been looking at in the past. And just trying to, I mean, do you see your customer IQ, your own personal customer IQ over the last three years has grown quite a bit as you try to understand better what the data is telling you? Yeah, I think so. I think that the finance organization now, uh, because we do fp and we do, we, we need to do predictions. We need to understand a little more about, you know, the customers and what's going on. So there's more interaction, for example, with um, once we reveal or we 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 have insights with data, um, the th- that there are actionable next steps with say the customer success team. Hey, we've noticed this behavior with this customer. Is there anything going on that you're aware of? And so it knits things all together actually. So it it, it expands the the cross the, the cross company interactions and and insights. And it's also insights that can be fed back into some of these organizations. Hey, uh, we notice this customer's activity is behaving like this. Is this something that uh, you need to attend to or are attending to? And I also find once you once you cr- provide those insights, um, the function um, then takes that as, as kind of the, they level up. They say, oh, wow, we've got insight into this data and we notice a pattern let's just start tracking this. If we start seeing this pattern, we can take action. So it's, it's, it's really about, you know, not only collecting the data and reporting the data, but then um, making sure to focus on actionable data and, and having the organization, uh, the finance organization help support and roll that out to the rest of the company. We've, uh, enjoyed highlighting sort of your career as it went through sort of the different tech eras from the desk, desktop to the web being born to the dot-com era to the to the cloud. It's obvious to many, I think, that we're now entering a new era driven by AI technologies. You know, there are two, there's what it means to your finance function, but there's what it means to uh, your business model at, at large as well. I yeah, think. I think it, um, AI clearly is one of those um, era markers. It impacts just many things, business and non-business. I think that with respect to um, how I'm looking at it in the business, I'm already seeing it in the business with respect to our product development. So we've um, obvious, a lot of times, I've seen this before. Again, I'll go back to my career. I spent time in open source. I saw this in open source where it's a developer-led initiative that comes in the side door into the organization. And then once it's in, uh, you need to embrace it. You can't not embrace it. And this happened in open source. So when I was at Jasper Soft Open Source Company, we offered, uh, you know, go to market was... Um, uh, commercial licenses that protected against some of the concerns about open source, which was third-party software infringement. I think likewise, AI companies are going to have to, you know, mitigate the concerns, and it's happening at lightning speed. So I, you know, Congress is already involved in in regulation and so on and so forth. I'm actually seeing it sort of more at the ground level. 
my engineering team is already wanting to use it and is already using it. I'm aware that um, there can potentially be IP issues with using certain generative AI to generate code. There can be confidentiality issues with generative AI dragging data from an organization into a data set that then gets exposed. So uh, we're already moving fast to A, put an AI policy in place at the company, and then B, um, I've, uh, you know, I've, what I've done is, is as I've heard about this, I've connected directly with the leadership in the product and engineering team to work together on how can we leverage <clears throat> this technology. It's not that we're going to prevent this technology from entering the, the four walls. It's, it, it, it's, it's a thing. It's going to happen. Let's make sure we do it in a smart way and we leverage it. So, um, so I'll tell you interesting learnings we've already found. Um, uh, kind of a metric that's not really a financial metric. Um, engineers actually take a look at their efficiencies. It always used to be tough to understand, are you getting the bang for the buck out of your engineers? It's always a black box to us. And there was this mythical man month and the whole nine yards. Well, after development evolved into agile methodologies, et cetera, you now have something called story points that is the unit of measure for engineering efficiency. So we're able to actually see with having employed AI tools and generative AI, we're seeing a 4X increase in productivity so far with our data in our product and engineering team. So, we, so from a finance perspective, I see massive opportunity for ROI doing more with less. From a legal perspective, I see we need to be, make sure we do it in a smart way so we don't actually so we don't accidentally hit any 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 legal uh, third rails that might not be what you expected me to talk about in the product and engineering side i could tell you also in the support side we're looking at chatbots as a way to to help customers self serve with knowledge bases that's much more interactive and again from a finance hat perspective more roi do more with less and then, of course, just in the in the area of what we do f as a company and what we do in finance, which is you know, because we actually are our own customer as well, there's a lot of opportunity in the back end to um, just turbocharge a lot of the automation and the efficiencies that we can get uh, by leveraging AI. I've seen this previously in my career in sort of early uh, an early iteration where uh, machine learning was used to pattern match on a customer um, level when is a good time, for example, to to present a credit card given you know when the card would be um, have have capacity, et cetera. And this was data scientists developing machine learning models. So this is the next you know obviously ten x version of that with this new generative AI. I think that we, you know, there are going to be opportunities to introduce this and into workflows, into uh, automation, and 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 really into maybe air traffic controlling the entire cash workflow. Wow, Scott, some wonderful insight for us. Thank you. We are uh, interested in uh, asking you a finance strategic moment. Uh, we always ask this question a little after our business discussion. Uh, but we're looking for a moment of insight that you've experienced during your career, one that allowed you to think a little differently, uh, allowed you to maybe you were avoiding risk. Maybe it was pursuing opportunities. Don't know. What comes to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? Uh, I would say uh, a lot of the ways that as finance leaders, we control our businesses and we and we communicate what I call spending envelopes is based on benchmarks. We go out and we benchmark uh, what companies that are successful are doing. We have rule of 40. We have percents of revenue um, sort of benchmarks. I think one of the sort of strategic moments I had was not that I don't do it, but it's the way I communicate it. And uh, it's the way I've rolled it out in the organization. So rather than going as, I've always tried not to be the finance police. I try to be sort of the uh, the the finance um, mentor, the finance guider. I, 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 I so rather than roll out benchmarks and 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 explaining, hey, you need to be at this level because of that. I've taken a different approach. I actually roll out a message of 
everybody in the company uh, is a is a capital allocator. We're looking for investments. We we look to make investments in the company, and we look for return out of the investments we make. We look for ROI out of the investments we make. So, for example, when I look at how much uh, the R and D budget and the product budget is, I'm I'm looking at that as an investment in product development and an ROI on the top line. So I I knit together the tasks of the leaders to budget and keep themselves in budget guidelines, not from a sort of benchmark perspective, but by getting buy-in that we're all investors together in this in this startup company and we're all capital allocators. So I really think it's and by creating that framework, it it's a it's a really it's a really powerful way then every quarter or every iteration to re-emphasize we're investing in this because of that. The the budget for this is because the return on this is that. So I, I feel like setting the stage and creating the framework in that way early creates a powerful platform for effectively managing the business on an ongoing basis. From episode 830, this is One Minute with Sandra Rowland, CFO of Xylem. And, you know, I think it's all about getting, you know, quicker information to data so that you can help your business partners drive, drive insights. So, you know, what we're always after as a finance organization is to spend less time gathering the financial information and compiling it and more time trying to drive insights to help our business partners and our our enterprise to grow profitably. Uh, We're going to jump to what we refer to as the mentoring round, where I'll ask you several quick questions, beginning with this one. That first 90 days, you were a CFO, first 90 days, all that responsibility first landed on your shoulders. And if you could go back in time and just give yourself one piece of advice, there's something you wish you knew during that first 90 days, something someone had said to you. Anything? Early on in my career, I was probably, like many people are, quick to make uh, make moves or to craft things the way that I thought they should be from the get-go. There's a lot of value in understanding how things are being done and simply, you know, using judo or 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 simply adjusting slightly to get to a better result. It's very it's very difficult to make wholesale um, changes. It's disruptive to the to the org, um, and it can be a challenge. So I think less is more would be something that, you know, me as a young bull in the china closet, <laughs> uh, I, what else can I say? Less is more, measure twice, cut once. I would, I'd say, you know, less is more uh, when, when making any sort of changes to the organization. Sometimes you have to, but take the time to assess, is there some way that I can take what's being done and simply adjust it? It may not be the way I would have done it, but it, it, it's, it, it's, it's effective. Look for effectiveness. We'd like to ask our guests to reflect a little on the personal side. We're wondering if you have a personal habit, part of a daily routine, something you're known for over time. Is there something that you do that sets you apart? Something? So if this is this something that uh, if you're asking personal things that I, I do, um, I, I try to I try to make sure that I get enough sleep. I m- try to meditate. I do yoga. I exercise. We've got a high stress job. You can't burn at, a, you know, you can't turn it up to 11 all the time. So just understanding you need to, you need to take care of yourself in order to do this job because it can be a high stress job. What about a book uh, you'd recommend? It doesn't have to be a business book. Maybe it, it's just a book that influenced you in one way. Maybe it's something you escape with. So uh, completely off the track, I feel like uh, the book Sapiens is is phenomenal. It's uh, it it it's, uh, it really gives a different perspective on looking at you know us as humans, and you know the 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 big piece that I took away was how we're able to 
um, use our use our intellect to create these fictive realities um, that that allows us to organize in in companies or nations or you know what what have you. So that that to me is a is a book that I think is uh, is is incredible. Thank you for that. Uh, we are up to our final question where we're going to ask you to look forward finally. And we're wondering for this next 12 months, what are your priorities as CFO of Paystan? Well, I think um, continuing balanced growth. We've always been a balanced growth company, so strong growth and profitable growth and, and always thinking about the ROI. I think leveraging the new technology, we talked a little bit about it, leveraging AI, um, continuing to leverage blockchain uh, uh, in, our, in our offering. I think that for all CFOs right now, you know, where are the markets going to land, the, you know, pricing uh, on anything from fundraising to M&A or whatnot is, is, has not settled down. I think it's gotten a little better, but um, that's something that we're looking at. And then, you know, we, uh, uh, Paystand Act is, is an acquirer. We, we look for, you know, opportunities to acquire companies. So keeping an eye out for good acquisitions that, that add more value to our, to our offering. Those are the things over the next 12 months. Scott Benyon, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thanks, Jack. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thought Leader listeners, as you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as Thought Leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.